Já vás všechny vítám při tomhletom velmi neobvyklém okamžiku a to na 31. možná že už 32. ročníku biologických čtvrtků, který je poprvé online. Tak nevím, jestli jste chtěli být tohle okamžiku v přítomní nebo ne, ale právě tak je. Než se dostanu do, než přejdu do angličtiny, tak bych vás poprosil o pár technických záležitostí. Prosím, slumte si všichni mikrofony, pokud tak nemáte. A naopak, jestli můžete, tak si zapněte kamery, ať náš přednášející vidí, že opravdu někomu přednáší. Tak, já než, já než předám slovo našemu dnešnímu přednášejícímu, tak jako vždy, to se nemění, bude upoutávka na příště. Příště se setkáme opět tedy v půl šesté a přijde nám přednášet Marek Eliáš. Ta přednáška se jmenuje Lin Margulis Revisited a bude to o mitochondriích a bakteriách, bakter, plast, mitochondriích a plastech bakteriálnějších, než si myslíte. Takže jste všichni zváni i na příště. A nyní tedy přijdu, přejdu do angličtiny. Tamáš, I'm already switching to English. So uh, it's my great pleasure, and it's also one of the advantages that uh, we are online, that we, we can invite guests uh, who are actually uh, very far from us. So Tamás is, uh, for instance, now in uh, a deep forest in Estonia. And uh, uh, this, is, this is quite interesting because uh, uh, Tamás uh, is having several uh, different affiliations. One of them is in uh, Chile. Uh, another one is in Helsinki, which is close to uh, Estonia, and uh, uh, third one is in uh, Oxford in uh, UK. Uh, his ac uh, academic career is also very colorful. Uh, so he started as an economist, he studied economy, and uh, what economists mostly do, they do business. So in some point of his, of his life, he turned to business, but uh, also as uh, some business people do, he got tired uh, of it. Uh, and uh, perhaps he did it in the right time because it was a uh, year before uh, economic crisis. And of course he says that he predicted and that's why he left uh, 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 economic uh, business. And then uh, he came back to academia. Uh, he started to work with uh, Robin Dunbar and uh, other people and uh, most of his work is on social networking, but uh, also many other uh, issues. And uh, very recently, he also started uh, his uh, documentary series. So if uh, you Google his name, uh, then you can uh, watch uh, his uh, YouTube videos. And uh, uh, he will give us talk today um, on uh, matriocracy, on human matriocracy, uh, which uh, I think will be quite uh, provocative. So, uh, Tamash, uh, I shouldn't say floor is yours or perhaps screen is yours now. So I'm passing word to you. Unmute, unmute, please. Yeah, please unmute, yeah. So from now on it's down here. The mute bit, it bit was, the, was the best bit. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I is this so as you said, this is I'm in the Estonian forest, so I'm surrounded by six thousand bears, and and I I hope the light is going to be strong enough because I'm because I'm right in the middle of the forest, of a country which has a constitution in the constitution the right for internet access, which is brilliant except that it seems that in some spots only so in this house where, with the library behind me in front of me amazingly 30 years of national geographic on here like i'm deep down among six thousand bears uh and but this is the only spot which has uh internet but also doesn't have a lot of light so <clears throat> um if you can't see me it is your advantage um okay so this is going to be a, I've written a book, um, which uh, uh, is called Matriocracy, and I would like to tell you about it. Um, 
And then uh, I would be extremely keen to, to hear your, your views of, because some bits are a little bit more controversial than others. Um, just beforehand, uh, one of you actually read the book and commented on the book, uh, uh, Zuzanna Sterbova. So I just want to say that everything that's wrong is her fault and everything that's not is mine. Uh, and now Zuzka just turned completely red. So um, if you look at her on the thing. Okay, all right. So now that we, we, we demonstrated a bit of human behavior, um, let's switch to the talk. Uh, okay. So uh, can everybody see this? And you can hear me. Great. So I'd like to tell you uh, the story of matriarchy. Yeah, and it's really my editor insisted, although this is a science book, we should be able to sell books. So it has to have a sort of a political subtitle. So hence the subtitle is the evolutionary case to end patriarchy, which actually it is, uh, as you will see, but also evolutionary case for, for patriarchy as well. So, okay, how do I, ah, oh, here. Um, so, um, obviously this is uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, marching together with, with uh, a Venus figurine uh, and sort of making the point that, maybe not so subtly, that Venus figurines are called Venus figurines because a bunch of male archaeologists found them and they thought, ah, naked woman must be a sex symbol or sex uh, toy. Uh, actually, it was only until the 1970s when um, uh, a bunch of feminist anthropologists, all of them at the time were women, uh, who looked at the Venus figurines and they said, well, the adiposity pattern is more consistent for, with a, with a postmenopausal uh, female body. So this is a grandmother. So these Venus figurines were all grandmothers. And of course, it seems that they were, they, one possible story we tell is that they were uh, objects of ancestor worship in, 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 the, in the cultures that, that lived where you are now and where I was born in Hungary. Of course, with a new global figure, global leader, future uh, uh, um, grandmother, Greta Thunberg. Okay, how do I do this? So uh, this was the emotional starting point. Uh, and now let's go a little bit towards the science. So if we looked at our species social organization, would you think that it is a patriarchal species, a matriarchal species or a gender equal species? So, if the chimpanzees are male dominated, aggressive, the very pronounced hierarchy, a lot of intergroup violence. So I think we can conclude that's a patriarchal uh, social organization. The bonobos are female dominated, peaceful, with a moderate hierarchy, and they have intergroup peace. So when two chimpanzee groups meet, they will fight it to death. And then when two bonobo groups meet, they're going to have sex with each other and they're going to play with each other. So these are the two species that are closest related to us. So it's, it's, it doesn't really help us figure out which one we are. So this is going to be really the question of this talk. Which one are we? Can we know how the social organization of a species emerges? What are the factors behind that? So I will first um, show you that there's a lot of variation in gender rules. 
And then I will show you some of the assumptions that I'm making in the argument. And I will show you six factors that I think, or I argue, drive the social organization in our species. Four ecological factors and two societal factors. The ecological factors will have to do with, with resources, yeah? So the, the distribution of the resources, the predictability of the resources, the scarcity of the resources, and the exploitability of the resources, under which what I mean is how large a group you need to exploit the resource. <clears throat> and the societal factors will be technology and fertility. And I will, I will show you how these might explain the changes the past 12,000 years, including the changes that are ongoing now in this particular species. So let's go for first the glossary of terms. So metricacy is a noun that we made up, obviously from matriarchy and democracy. It's a balanced power between women and men in the democracy with a hint of female rules, so a bit of female advantage. The patriarchy is also a noun, which I think is a male dominated intermezzo in the world history. And hence is increasingly becoming obsolete as a concept. I think we are going to look back patriarchy as something that was just present for a period in, in, our, in, our, in our species history. Right. So obviously this is where the Venus figurines were all around, uh, all around uh, uh, the the in Europe under the ice. Uh, these are all the places where some form of Venus figurine was found. Um, and so as long as, if we think that Venus figurines were fig female leaders um, or well, ancestor worship objects of female leaders, then we can think that this was really uh, the, the general pattern in all of uh, sub-ice, uh, uh, sub uh, Europe. And that would suggest that, because we don't see it now, that there's a lot of variation in, in rules around, around women and rules around when, what women can do and what men can do uh, across cultures and eras. So look at this, this panel first. The first panel, uh, the first one is, all, all of these are whether you have gender equal inheritance rules in a society. So what you see here is that the gender equal, in general, in the world in 1920, equal inheritance was not gender equal. Yeah, so there's a light blue means that the inheritance rules were not gender equal. In 90, by 1980, it became much closer to gender equal. And then by today, there's the general rule. If you look at female suffrage, uh, you see a very similar pattern that in, in 1913, basically there was no female suffrage apart from some Scandinavian countries and Australia and New Zealand. And then gradually in 1950, a lot more. And today the exception is when you do not have female suffrage. So what we see here is that the rules in this species are change in time and vary in space, which is really weird. And hence leads to the question, why? What drives these rules? Why? So I suggest that our social norms around gender rules are adaptive. So this is a little bit of a, a sketch of, of where I think this question is coming from. What is the intellectual history of, of this question? So, so uh, Marx, who, by the way, lived exactly the same time as Darwin, um, he, and, and a generation later, or two generations later, so Marx's grandchildren's generation lived Durkheim, Weber, and Westermark. 
uh, amazingly, uh, uh, not only almost uh, 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 entirely overlapping lives, but their big respective big work, words, works came out almost exactly the same time. Uh, incredible, yeah? But of course, from especially Durkheim came the social construction idea, which led to gender studies idea of, of how the rules around women and men is really driven by power dynamics and Weber's the heritage of institutions. So this is where the question comes from, yeah? So where, why is there variation? But I'm approaching it in a different route, a route that's coming from Darwin and led to, of course, Westermark, and then the great uh, ethologist, behavioral scientist of Tim and Lawrence and, and Hamilton, the, the, the follower of Tim Bergen, and Ibe Eisfeld, follower of Lawrence. Um, and I'm, I will show you an arg a possible argument, a possible answer to the gender studies question, which is not using the Durkheimian social constructivist, uh, but rather an, an evolutionary uh, framing. And, and the, the assumptions, the foundational elements of the argument I will show come in, in four parts. Um, uh, uh, three parts, sorry. So first, the assumption is that the social organization is an adaptive trait in group living animals. I don't think it's particularly controversial. It is genetically, genetically inherited in most animals. Uh, but of course, social learning and culture plays a very important role in the species that are plastic somehow, that there's some kind of flexibility. The next, maybe still not that controversial, is culture in itself can be an adaptive trait. So, so obviously physical manipulation of the environment, like for tool use, uh, the, the fact that you can do it is adaptive. The fact that you can pass on, you can do social learning is adaptive. Uh, and within that, when you are not dealing with tools, but social technologies, uh, then cultural rules about the social behavior uh, can be adaptive as well. And hence the third assumption that comes from these is the cultural regulation of the social organization. The cultural regulation of the rules for women and the rules for men can also be adaptive. And that is, uh, that is the, the key, a key assumption here. So what, if I wanted to take apart all my arguments, I would go for this. This is like the juggler, juggler, <coughs> right? So let's go for these four characteristics. Uh, the distribution of the resources, the predictability of the resources, the scarcity of the resources, and the exploitability of the resources. And I will try to show you how these together determine um, the, the, uh, the social organization that we are going to see. Let's start with the first, the, dis the, the distribution of resources. So uh, if you have a group of beings that live together, of course, there's plenty of, of, of reasons why some sort of division of labor uh, almost division labor specialization might occur. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I will refer to Hamilton. Uh, this. Of course, it's possible that that division of labor is going to be along some key traits of group members. And it is the case for every forager culture that there is a division of labor between the sexes. So if you look at Gillian Hatfield's um, list of 50 technologies, don't go, don't worry, we're not gonna go down all of this. I just want to show you that there's a 50 there. Uh, so the 50 technologies, uh, let me zoom in. Uh, so they, they, they are ranging, I'll go back for a, for a second. So they are going, they are lined up to how masculine, how male they are. So this index is what allowed us, allowed her to sort this. So the, the more ma most masculine is hunting large aquatic fauna, yeah? So 
out of all the cultures in which hunting large aquatic sauna existed, uh, 48, all of them, it was an, uh, an only male uh, uh, specialization. None of them had mostly male, none of them had equal, none of them had mostly female, and none of them had entirely female. And there are a few others, like smelting of ore, smelter working, lumbering, hunting large, large land fauna, like the bears out here, if I was brave enough. Uh, so almost all of them, 139 cultures, for which there is data on this, uh, are, this is exclusively a male specialization and only five in which sometimes women, women come along but still dominantly male. So clearly there are going after dangerous animals out there. It's a male thing. And if you jump to the very bottom of it, the preparation of vegetal foods, it is overwhelmingly female. Sometimes, very rarely, men will be doing this only. Sometimes it's shared. Mostly it is either uh, predominantly female or entirely female job. So from this, you would think, all right, this is a straightforward thing, straightforward uh, uh, logic into this. But there's this weird thing in the middle of this list. So let's go straight to the half, halfway of the 50. Preparations of skins. And look at the pattern here. So in 39 cultures, only men prepare the skins. In a few cultures, men and women can both prepare skins. And in 31 cultures, only women prepare the skins. So there's something really weird going on here. Because it seems that there are some kind of tasks that are, are male only everywhere. And you would expect that there would be some kind of underlying story, story there. And some others were female only. But then in the middle, you see strong division of labor, but it's not characteristic which way for preparation of skins, which is pretty important. If you look at Frank Marlowe's uh, a decade later, uh, Frank was sort of having a similar kind of, 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 of uh, characterization. And what, we, what he showed is that large aquatic fauna and large land fauna is same pattern and vegetal foods is the same pattern with, with something in between. So this gives the possibility that, that there are two possible things going on here, which is along the characteristics of the resources out there in the environment. So if, if you have some, something which is difficult to find and then it is difficult to access, and it's dangerous, then you might want to use the bit of the group that is frankly replaceable. Maybe a little faster, maybe a little stronger, but most importantly replaceable. And if you have a bunch of resources that are fairly easy to find, they're all around, uh, easy to access, you have a, a digging stick or just pick something, and not dangerous, then you might want to use the bit of the group that is likely to be pregnant or have kids uh, 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 breastfeeding uh, all day. So that, that would explain the logic of the two ends. But geniusly, Gillian Hatfield explained what happens in the middle. Because she said, if you have predominantly pair, pair bonded uh, uh, groups, then you want to be specialized in something as you learn, as you grow up, in which your potential future partner is not going to be specialized. She called it marriage, and of course, most hunter gatherers don't have marriage. But, but the point is that, that if, you have, if you have this kind of within the small family unit, raising kids unit, you have specialization, through generations, you will have some sort of division of labor, some sort of sex-based specialization, but it's not going to be characteristic which way. So it's a, this suggests that there are two different things going on at the same time with division of labor. But in general, there is always 
division of labor in hunter-gatherer societies. But amazingly, this, can also, this doesn't come with the repression of women. So these are not patriarchal societies. And if you have an insight, once you have an insight into this, just think about, you need to speak peace of somebody in the family. Somebody you need to make somebody really angry. So is it going to be your bodybuilder brother who's three times as strong as you are? Or is it going to be your grandmother who cooks for the, for the family every Sunday lunch? I mean, obviously, you'd rather be so the, 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 the brother, yeah? Because the wrath of the grandmother will be deadly. I mean, but she's tiny. She's weak. Clearly, there's a network capital here that is explaining that little bit of female advantage. And, and, and if you want to have an actual uh, uh, evidence that there is gender equality in forager cultures, we can look at the residency patterns. When there's a new couple, where will the new couple go? To the men's primary kin or the women's primary kin? And if you look at these uh, 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 cultures, hunter-gatherer cultures, uh, what you can see is there's no general pattern, which is evidence for what actually Mark Debo showed as well in his work is that hunter-gatherer societies in general are gender equal. And it is the exceptions, and there are some exceptions that we need to understand why. I think we can understand why, I will get back to that. So I think this is an early form of matriarchy, so gender equality, uh, without much of democracy, of course, because that was earlier. Which is weird because if we think about today, or if I, you know, if we, if we ask people ourselves, is our species patriarchal, matriarchal, or gender equal? I think a lot of us would say, wait, 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 wait. It's obviously patriarchal. We are living in patriarchal societies. But look at this. This, is this a green, predominantly green or predominantly red? Uh, obviously it's predominantly green. I, I'm making a, a point with an example. So it seems that patriarchy was only a dominant form of social organization for 2% of, of our species history, which is what's represented by these red dots. But of course, this was not the pattern. The pattern is that they are at the end. And of course, we can't really see because we can't really see that deep. So what we see is ourselves and the recent past. So all this, we need to remind ourselves, was very likely gender equal. But we see something else here that we're not only maybe predominantly gender equal, but also super flexible. And, and this, is, this is gonna be important when we, when we get into the point of of understanding of what is happening with how it changes, what drives a change. I'm desperately trying to see what time it is. Okay. Uh, Jan, when we are half an hour into, could you please tell me? Great, thank you. So I would su suggest that the first... That's right now. Is it? Oh dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going very slow. I would suggest that the first key, re key characteristic is the, re is, a, is the resources, is the predictability of the resources that we see. So if you look at the climate variation of the past 800,000 years, uh, obviously this is you now. Obviously most of it is cold. So a lot of ice, I would be covered by kilometers of ice here, uh, but also very varied. You can't really see what is happening here. So let's zoom in for the next 50 years. And what you see in the last 50 years is that a lot of variation, yeah? And it's suddenly whoo, stable, yeah? If you look at the standard deviation, high standard deviation and suddenly stable. So stability of the, of the climate arrived about 200 years ago. Uh, we have a name for it, the Holocene, yeah? And, and that created something that changed the economics of foraging. Because if you don't really know what's, what you're going to hunt or what you're going to, what's, what's going to grow because the climate is changing all the time, there's no point investing in anything. But once it's stable, you know that what is best growing this year will be growing next year. Uh, so 
hence you create a pen for the animals, you create a clearing for the plants. So, and with that, of course, domestication happens, yeah? So from the goat come, becomes a sheep or an auroch comes, if it's really dangerous, becomes this, the cows, you know, really docile, peaceful. And, and from the different kinds of grasses, you can have um, uh, you know, wheat and, and maize, corn and rice. And, in fact, we know that this logic of the stability of the climate created at least 11 different parts led to the invention of agriculture, invention of domestication. Uh, and they were independent from each other, not spreading from any one point. Uh, and that has a very interesting thing because once you have stability and once you are investing into these plants, you are increasing the value of these plants. So whereas if you have a forest and you are sort of hunting for something in the forest, there's no point individually dominating any part of the forest because they go away. But once you have a pen and you invest into this pen uh, for you know, domesticated mounting of sheep, uh, then the logic, uh, the cost and benefit of fighting for it changes. And that led to a male dominated social organization so agriculture lets, leads to an advantage of physical strength yeah? with, with all the consequences of the male dominated social organization of, of hierarchy and warfare and patriarch, almost going, going towards a chimpanzee way of existence of our species. And if you would like to have an insight to this, imagine that you are at home with your kids, you are a farmer and the, all the neighbor's food uh, was taken by the mice and, and you will need to be protected or the neighbors will take the food because your food was stayed. Someone's kids will die. So who are go you going to ask to protect your food reserves? Obviously, I'm putting it to the very extreme that, that you're going to ask the aggressive looking, uh, whatever, unpleasant bodybuilder brother rather than the pregnant sister. And so that answer is really, I think, the key of how the stability of the climate led to agriculture and that led to the male domination of the resources, uh, which then led to sex rules once you have scarcity. So obviously when you have scarcity, someone's kids uh, will, 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 will die. And, and when you have, uh, uh, when you, the population, this is, this is World Bank data, that links the populations in absolute poverty and infant mortality and makes the obvious point, if the population is near the carrying capacity, kids will die. And that means that it makes sense to do whatever you can <coughs> to get, to get, uh, um, uh, to get more resources for your kids. So in a matriarchy or, fem or, or in a society when women are controlling the reproductive decisions, women will hack the males. Think of the, uh, what is happening in, in partible paternity societies. So this is where we have partible paternity still today, where the children will have more than one father. And the mothers will demand uh, resources from all the fathers in proportion of their probability of, of, of fathering the child. There was one ingenious um, anthropologist who added up all the probabilities, yeah? So obviously all the probabilities should add up to 100%. Because, you know, one child, one biological father. And all the assigned probabilities that women assigned to the man was above 100%. So women oversold the kids. Um, straightforwardly going for the resources. When men control the, the, the resources, then, then they are going to reward women for increased paternity certainty. And that is the point when the rules around sexuality, constraining sexuality come in. That is the point where increased paternity certainty will take the form or will, will come on the back of a bunch of rules around sexuality. 
uh, all of us here on Zoom are presume are wearing a top if we are having a, 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 you know, our, our images, but, but maybe wearing just underwear, nothing under if you are not, not here. But obviously that's one of the sexual, sexual rules, yeah? Like one of the rules that we will not show genitals, yeah? Which is not true for all the cultures, obviously, but it's true for us. Uh, and, and that's a very, very basic form or an example for a sexual rule. And here's an example for the link between scarcity and sex rules. So this is uh, World Bank data combined with the Pew Global's data of what is driving, uh, sorry, this is, forget this, right? Uh, well, what, is, what is driving uh, whether you disapprove sex between unmarried adults, yeah? So whether, whether you are subscribing to a sexual rule and very clearly as poverty increases, this the disapproval increases. But then we have actually three different poverty measures. And then it seems that the tighter the poverty measure is, the higher the disapproval is. So poor cultures, populations living in poverty, or poverty are more likely to have a more, more uh, strict, a stricter, uh, more constraining sexual rules. So, which leads, leads to the, the, the next uh, question. All right, so this is about sex rules. How about marriage? What's interesting is that if you have, take another um, uh, factor, exclu exploitability of the resource. I named it exploitability because uh, I didn't find any proper word. What do I mean is how large a group you need to exploit the resources out there. So basically, what is the optimal group size? And in general, this is a, 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 a varies by habitat and ecological problem. Um, and, and it's sort of the free rider problem. Um, our species does this by building kin networks. And I don't want to get in, in all the details into that, but um, um, the kin networks will, we want to expand our kin networks as far as possible to have ever larger collaborating groups. And which was actually shown uh, uh, via the research of Napoleon Chagnon is that when you build up this uh, social network, uh, that will lead to uh, uh, a certain number of, of people. But Thank when you, you pair up with... Uh, when you are pairing up with someone, obviously you can extend your, your kin network a lot. And that creates a lot of new relationships. And, you know, weirdly, if you're pairing up with someone, that creates a new sibling for your sibling. So, so, and the only reason you would care about what your sibling thinks about the new sibling, uh, this is the only reason you would actually uh, introduce a new partner to your sibling, to your parents, because the network compatibility is important between the two sides. And the only reason it is important because that creates a new cooperative unit, a larger social network. You extend the kinship on which you can do collaborative action together. And this is exactly where traditional marriage comes in because it allows a larger kin network, which was invented by a lot of different cultures all around the planet every patriarchal culture invented some form of rule, some set of rules that will force together a couple when they really don't want to stay together anymore. Because that's the point of marriage, yeah? Um, or marriage rules. You don't need to have rules if they want to stay together. So that comes from the fact that you are, you need to exploit the resources. So these were the four ecological factors, the distribution of resources, the predictability of resources, the scarcity of resources, and the exploitability of resources. And I think those four together tell the story of why hunter-gatherers are, are uh, gender equal, how with the stability of the climate that shifted to a patriarchy, and how with the rise of patriarchy, the sexual rules 
changed towards controlling paternity certainty and how the marriage concept emerged. But of course, uh, the, our societies have some characteristics that will affect the, the, the resources. And primarily, you know, how, what kind of technologies you have, you can have different kinds of resources. So uh, if I had a really good gun here, I would be less scared of the bears. Uh, I would still be scared, but less scared of the bears. And I could go hunting for deer out here. Uh, so obviously that tool would increase a bunch of, increase the carrying capacity for me of this environment. So technology is obviously having an, uh, an effect. Um, so it changes the way the habitat appears for us. And, it, and then we would think that if the, if the environment is being changed, then all of those factors should also change or could possibly also change. Yeah? The point is that for a long time during agriculture, uh, as agriculture got, or got hold, all the changes, all the new technologies actually increased the, the more empowered the, the logic of, of patriarchy. So it was ever deeper patriarchal systems. But then something changed because on the back of the, of the industrial revolution in, in Britain, Cheap energy created uh, uh, the, the, the replacement system for the expensive labor. And hence, of course, uh, in the industrial revolution happened and then something key, key happened with there. The ecology of the job appeared. And with that, if you think about the ecology of a job, yeah? So what is a job, a factory job? What is the ecology of it? It's fairly easy to access. You show up, uh, easy to find, you know where it is, you're easy to accept, you show up, and it's fairly safe. So a factory job has all the characteristics of the, of the, the resources that women tend to be specialized in forager hunter gatherer societies. And with that, we, are, we start to shift away from the logic of the patriarchy with a problem. The problem is if you have seven kids, you are not going to be able to hold down a job or get educated to hold down a job. So if you look at what happens in the, in the Sahel region, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the last remaining human population with seven kids per woman, pretty much the edge of the possibility, you can see that how the logic of not being able to get, get education and then not being able to, able to enter the, the, the labor force maintains the patriarchal system. What's happening here? I just did this. Okay. And this is why fertility which I think is a second social factor, is going to be so important. So this is like a, kind of like a fertility overview. Yeah? So in the uh, deep time, uh, in hunter-gatherer, forager, hunter-gatherer time, it, the fertility is about four and a half, five kids per woman. So hunter-gatherer women start limiting in their 30s and they end up with about on average four and a half, five kids. In, in agriculture societies, it goes up to, Six, six and seven, of course, we know about some cases when it goes above seven for a long time. We have proper data for the global society from 1960. So at 1960, the, the, if you look at the global society as one population, the number of kids per woman was 5.2. Today, it's 2.5. So it's, obviously it came down and it's falling. And that created a completely new situation. Because with falling fertility, women can enter the labor market and the job is there. So that takes away the logic of the original logic of, of the patriarchy, of, of male advantage of physical force. Look at this, the number of kids, this is against the, the World Bank data. And 
combined with the World Value uh, Survey, answering whether women should have the same uh, labor market rights as men. As the kids, number of kids fall, the general cultural value that women should have the same labor market rights as men increases. Something else is going on here because when you have ongoing technological improvement, so there's a pie is increasing in size, then you have a rising income and at the same time fertility is falling, then the average income is going to rise. So this is uh, the data from what we have. Uh, this is again for the world average. We don't have deeper data to, to, to have this, but it starts from 1999. This is the chart per woman on average. And this is the GDP per capita for the global society. The pattern is straightforward. Ah. And with that, absolute poverty. Absolute poverty that drove the strong need to hack each other and ha in a patriarchal system have a strong sexual rules disappear. So in, in around 1815, for which there's this estimate, the poverty and absolute poverty was well above 80%. Absolute poverty here meaning that people are on the edge of survival, a little negative shock and you die of starvation. I grew up in Hungary, I was born in 1970. There were always in the news people who were starving. Today, there's no, or hardly at all, uh, mass starvation on the planet. Right now, poverty, absolute poverty, essentially disappeared. And with that, infant mortality collapses. This is the proportion of absolute poverty and this is infant mortality. Straightforward, obviously with the mediator of, of uh, medical science. So that leads us to the point where also the number of relatives for, sorry, I don't know what, what happened to the, to, the, to the slides. So I'm sorry, that messed up something. But, but not only you have women can join the labor market, income is rising, absolute poverty disappears, infant mortality collapses. But also you have fewer relatives, yeah? So if you are living in a society when there are five people who survive to adulthood, so it's a very high fertility society, you're gonna have four siblings and 20 cousins on your mom's side, 20 cousins on your father's side, you've got 40 first degree cousins. So all you've got 44 relatives close relatives in the same generation, plus their, their spouses, <coughs> if you have a spouse system, 88 people. You have a ton of people to create the kin network with, yeah? But if you have only two, which is of course higher than in the Czech Republic or Estonia or Hungary or the UK, you're going to have one sibling, four first sibling cousins, so in-laws and sibs, five. So you, you go from 88 people to 10. You run out of relatives to populate the social network with. So you become friends and you are organizing, you, you populate your social network with friends and you are organizing your collective action on different ways. Of course, the modern economy emerges. And with that, the logic of traditional marriage goes away. So with, with the changing technology and the falling fertility, both of these actually starting, the very early point was the, was the 18th century, 18th century Europe, the, the logic for regulating sexuality and the logic for traditional marriage disappears. Look at, this is the percentage of children born outside marriage in the OECD from 1960 to, uh, to 2015. straightforward. And a lot of these, more than half of, of these couples, those couples who are not here, get divorced during the, the childhood of the children. So by f above more than, more than half of the children growing up now are either born outside marriage or their, their parents divorce. So clearly the marriage concept 
forcing together people who don't want to stay together is lost its power. So I suggest that all of this ends, results in the end of patriarchy today. And if, it's in the, if it takes place in the global democracy, and I know that right now, 2020 being a little crappy, uh, this is a, uh, we can talk about the long-term long -term trend, but I would call it a metriocracy. And metriocracy, women take back the control of reproductive decisions. Yeah? So the contraception use rises. Uh, women make the contraceptive decisions. Uh, it was only a few decades ago that, that not only rape, but marital rape became a crime. And of course, there's a right to abortion. And with that, the percentage of adult women using contraception in the global society, this is global population, this is for the, our entire species, has been increasing. And this is driven by access to contraception. So the higher demand satisfied, the higher the contraception uses. And the, 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 the regulation around sexuality in all around the planet is, is loosening up. And that is not only for, for, for heterosexuals, but sexuality in general. So for instance, this is data from the World Value Survey that the tolerance of homosexuality correlates very strongly whether you think it's okay to have sex before marriage in a heterosexual uh, uh, setting. And amazingly, we can also see that this is driven primarily about more, more about women than about men. So tolerance before sex, sex before marriage correlates with inverse political misogyny. So basically, this is the higher, the more you think that women can be good leaders as well, political leaders. Premarital sex has become, and is becoming the norm. And I think straightforward, it has become the norm all around the planet, almost everywhere, not everywhere. And it's amazing how with that, the within country variation of sexuality, it opens up. So if you look at the olden times, you know, each country, each, each culture, not country, each culture would have its own rules about sexuality, and they would be really strictly adhering to that. So that means that within the culture, the variation would be very little. Across cultures, you would have some variation because the cultures differ. Today, you have the opposite. Across cultures, you don't have that much variation around sex rules, but within culture, people are people. So you have all kinds of sexual practices and sexual rules. So the within culture variation increases everywhere and very much everywhere the similar pattern. Which leads us to, okay, so what does it mean in terms of leadership? And goes back to greater. So we have, we're facing overpopulation. Straightforwardly, educated women have fewer children. So this is the female liter literacy and this is fertility. Straightforward relationship. The education rate and length of education is rising. So this is <clears throat> the percentage of people, women and men, who have got at least some schooling since the late 19th century, the second half of the 19th century. Clearly there's a gap, but both of them are going down. In fact, if you look at the average length of schooling for the global population, not only people are going to school, but, uh, the, the length of schooling is increasing to both sexes. And this ends sort of for the pop, pop, global population average around eight years. We can see that a, a bunch of different countries, the average of the two <coughs> has gone above 12 years. And every one of those cases, without exception, women have education longer than for men. So there is a cross here, somewhere here, no, actually further up, but somewhere, it's off the chart, there's going to be, there is a crossover, it seems. And we know that the length of schooling lowers fertility rate. So this is uh, uh, the educa mother's education level. So it's not the length of schooling. Probably it's a good, good guess that it correlates with the length of schooling. And the higher the education level of a mother is, the lower is the number of children. 
extremely large data set of 350,000 people. So the consequence is that population growth and starvation slows at the same time, which is like the weirdest thing. If you think about that, this is a biological <laughs> organism, yeah? Like the more, uh, the more, the fewer, the, the more resources there are, so the less malnourished we get, the lower the population growth is. Just think about it for a second. What? But that's clearly what's happening. All driven by increasing technology, technological improvement all the time, and falling fertility in our species. And then you could say, all right, so what about, what about the last couple of years with all these reversals? So maybe this was in the past, but clearly today, still there's patriarchy around the planet. Uh, actually, if you go decade by decade, rather than today versus yesterday, and the dominant rules go decade by decade, and you look at the entire population, what you find is every decade, you had more women's rights in the global population than the previous decade, including actually this decade. Just think about what happened the past 10 years. I'm in a country which is led by women, just north of in Finland, the cabinet, the majority of the cabinet is female. We had a sweeping Me Too movement, which brought out previously under the carpet normal behavior and changed the, the general behavior. behavior. So even now, with the possible backlash. It is just a, a backlash against the underlying trend. And women are now in, in, in political power. So if you actually look at the female heads of government in the, from the 1900s, heads of government meaning not only a figurehead like the Queen of England, but actually with power, straightforward increase. And not only that, these, these leaders, female leaders, are surrounding themselves with women or by women, yeah? So Empress, see, she, she ruled with an iron hand as a man, very masculine leadership, and all her uh, uh, top government officials were male. Compare that to Angela Merkel. She has tons of female, female and male leadership, and she has a female successor. If you look at the percentage of women in parliament, straightforward pattern, it's just the past 30 years. So I think we can argue that, that not only we are turning towards uh, a female, not only that they, we're returning to gender equality with a female advantage, but that will come with a bunch of advantages as well. In particular, women, if you think about the collapsing, collapsing biosphere, our existential crisis, women consistently in every survey are more likely to be uh, to have a longer time horizon and more likely to to worry worry about uh, uh, the environment and want to do something about it. Uh, <clears throat> the sensitivity to inequality is much stronger in women than men. Uh, I think we can argue that a female leadership is, would actually be great. And with, with new patterns, and I think that's one of the interesting things that we're gonna see. So are we going to have a new matriarchic, matriarchic uh, woman? This is a friend of mine who sorted out printing, 3D printing on space, or, or a different new breed of matriarchic male, matriarchic male, male. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau and Barack Obama might have been uh, uh, examples for this. Are we having a, a new form of sexuality in which polyamory is replacing the predominantly pair bonded, uh, um, pair bond in our species? So we've got obviously tons of questions here. So anyway, so I go back to, to Greta and, and repeat just this point that the Venus figurines might have been simple objects of ancestor worship of women. And clearly today, some of our leaders are women like this now 17 year old 
a girl turning a woman. Right, and with that, I'm finished, and I thank your attention with a bonobo Venus. Uh, and if, if you have comments and questions, I'd love to hear it. <laughs>